my daughter Nicolette was born September 7th, 2001. So I was actually on leave that week. Um, I'll never forget it. It was uh, Monday night football. The Giants were playing the Denver Broncos. We lost 21 to 10. Uh, I had baby duties. Uh, my, my daughter was just home from the hospital and I was up that night and I told my wife, get some rest. Uh, I'll watch the game and, and, uh, and take care of our daughter, uh, which I did. Uh, we were up you know, pretty much throughout the night. When I finally fell asleep in the morning, uh, I'll never forget it. I was uh, suddenly awakened by my wife who was crying hysterically around almost close to nine o'clock. I jumped out of bed. I said, well, I thought something happened uh, to our daughter. And uh, she says a, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. And I was like, okay. Um, and with that, as she's telling me, she turned on our television in our bedroom and it was right shortly after nine o'clock, I think around 9.02, the, the, the next plane hit the South Tower. And, uh, you know, they kept rerunning it on the news. And I said, and at that point, my, my house phone was ringing, my pager was going off. Um, and, you know, I remember walking downstairs and, and uh, my mother-in-law was living with us. Uh, she had my daughter and I kissed her on her forehead and I apologized for bringing her into this crazy world of ours. Uh, and I was gone for the next, I don't know how many years. I was attached to a, to a joint fugitive task force at the time in New York City, and uh, we responded down to, you know, uh, the area where both these airplanes hit the World Trade Center. Um, this was after they both had fallen uh, that I got there, and, and it was just total mayhem. I mean, the devastation, I thought I was in a third world country. What we did, I mean, immediately after, um, we were doing whatever we could from, from you know, digging people out and, and, and assisting with the ones that were injured. And it was just total chaos, total, uh, I've, again, I've never seen anything like it. You know, those of us that were downrange and, and up close and in person, it just, uh, it'll never go away. Shortly after that, I, I think it was a few days, maybe a week later, um, the the, the Department of Justice and, and through the president, obviously, had had ordered or mandated the U.S. Marshals to take over all level three airports. Uh, so I was actually a supervisor in charge of John F. Kennedy Airport, uh, JFK, here in New York City. It was just it was just uh, very chaotic. It was fragmented. When we when I got to JFK Airport, uh, you know the local security folks uh, they didn't have a clue, um, and, and and no no insult um, you know intended, but they just when it came to security and the devastation that had just happened a few days prior, um, you know we had to really take charge and and. and put a really uh, uh, wrap that place up. I mean, the security on, on still at the airport was insane. Even though everything was shut down, um, we had to uh, secure the major airlines, American Airlines, United Airlines, you know, the, the, the bigger um, terminals, if you will, and make sure that place was shut down. We had no idea what we were looking at, who we were looking at. Uh, so we had to shut that place down, set up perimeters, uh, set up security at all exits and entrances uh, at all the airports. Uh, we certainly had enough manpower uh, on our side and, and, it, and it worked well and, and it, it ended up being a pretty well-oiled piece of machinery. But I wasn't there. I was only there just for about a couple of months. And then um, I got a call from my boss in Washington with the U.S. Marshals and said, uh, you know, the military is now in the manhunting business and um, can you come down to Washington? I said, well, of course, you know, I'm, I'm a little busy, but I'll, I'll come down. So I, I get down there. I was read right on to a, uh, a military intelligence team. They were now in the manhunting business. I was the, uh, the lucky one in the Department of Justice and U.S. Marshals. Uh, to assist our military in, in how to find people. I mean, obviously the military's search and destroy and, and do their thing, but but now they had to step back and work an actual fugitive investigation. So I jumped in with two feet with these, uh, the best that we've got, thank God they're on our side. Um, I was at Fort Belvoir for quite a few uh, months, actually deployed. I was overseas in Afghanistan, up on the border, looking and, and searching for high value targets, cultivating informants, doing things that <clears throat> doing things that um, um, was done in a quiet way, and I can't get too much involved or, or have too much of a conversation about it still, but uh, it was an interesting, um, uh, well, I'll say interesting, but it was uh, exciting, interesting, and I felt like I was accomplishing something. I sit in a room with all of our intelligence folks, CIA, DIA, NSA, everybody, you know, the, the, I'm the village idiot, and I'm sitting there and bringing common sense and knowing how to, you know, when you 
chase people for a living, um, you get pretty good at it. And, you know, we had a lot of flexibility, obviously, in the, in the war zones that we were in at the time. Uh, and I was able to assist immensely. And not only that, training. I'm a huge proponent of training. And these folks I was working with, they used us as, as well in the training environment. I know I got the job done. I know I helped others, uh, you know, not only in the military and, and our folks, but, you know, citizens, people that, that sit home. And I think it was George Orwell that once said people sleep peaceably in their beds at night because rough men stand ready to do harm or to do violence on their behalf. Um, these are the rough men and women that are downrange every day. So we can sleep peaceably at night. Well, I was supposed to go out and talk to some judges uh, because they had the judges conference in D.C. And, you know, the director's supposed to talk to them and, you know, I guess they have to get in problems. So that's why I had to go in kind of early in the morning, you know, to meet with those judges. There's a bunch of them in town from all over the U.S. And uh, that was, I had to, you know, and uh, when I was driving into D.C., I was maybe 10 or 15 minutes out from headquarters. And my son called me, you know, he was a deputy in Baltimore. And he said, Dad, he said, they make the movie. Uh, about uh, a plane flying the World Trade Center in New York. He says, uh, have you seen us? No. He said, well, it's pretty neat, pretty clean. He says, I don't know why they make a movie like that in New York. I said, okay. And I, when I got to the office, you know, maybe 10 minutes later, I turned my TV on and another plane flew in. I said, this is not a movie. This is real, you know, this is a real thing. So it's not a movie. And uh, I try to alert some people. So uh, and we just watched it for a while. So we need to call a marshal in New York. And we couldn't get through. And I'm sitting there in my office, you know, in the Crystal City, overlooked the airport, uh, Reagan National Airport. And you could see, so I'm looking out my window and I saw this plane coming in and he was like upside down, you know, like he was uh, wanting, wanting to land upside down. And I said, why is this guy flying upside down? Is somebody, I don't know, a stunt pilot trying to make a name for himself at this airport. And all of a sudden he ran into the Pentagon, which I could see very clearly right in my window. It hit that Pentagon, it was just like somebody dropped an atomic bomb. We had to clear everybody out the building. We cleared out the building and we, we wanted to help, you know, the Pentagon, but we couldn't leave. We couldn't go there anyway. So we got out. Later on, we went back inside the building because there was all kind of, debris, not debris, but dust and stuff came through the ventilators and you had to get out because it was so bad. And after that was over, so we just kind of, I spent the night there, believe it or not, at the building. So the next day, uh, Told I need to get to New York right away and take some deputies. So I took 25 deputies to New York. And by the way, the Marshal Service, the only plane that they would allow into New York, JPAC. So we had to, I had to approve that, being the director. And once we got there, it's like something I've never seen before. It was just body parts all over the place and the smell and the burning debris. And it was just awful I and mean, just terrible. And you couldn't hardly see for all the smoke and everything. So, uh, and our job was to uh, uh, help the locals find uh, bodies, you know, live bodies, because people jumped out of buildings, and uh, the next time some more people got there, you know, for the marshal service, and the next state, states came up later on in the evening, so I went back to D.C., because I had to be on the command post. Uh, I'm dealing with the agent in the White House, so. And when I got back, they told me that we have to send Deputies and I was a special operation group that uh, 13 major airports in the U.S. And I can't remember all, but it was like St. Louis, Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, D.C., uh, Baltimore, and I've got all the others. But it was it was really uh, really a, a kept us busy for a whole week. And, uh, and then the judges, you know, we the AG said, make sure you take care of those judges. It must have been about 20 of them, so we had to relocate the judges. We'd activate the deputies in D.C. to have the judges. And this went on for about a couple of days, you know, back and forth and communication and getting people in and out and getting planes in. So it's really, really, a, it was a, something that you that you would see in the movies. And I didn't think this was real. I said, this can't be happening to us. But it did happen to us. And like I said, that uh, it was a long event. And, I, of course, I, I learned a lesson for it, from it. And to this day, I still think of that. And I'll never forget that. Well, we had to order not to do that, not to respond, because everybody wanted to respond, you know. And that's one thing about the Marshal Service. If that's a problem, they all want to respond. 
but we had more or less order in the stand in that district because we had enough people there and we don't want to uh, create a lot of confusion like that. So we had to order them to stay in the office and uh, we'll keep them, keep them advised. So, but they all want to go. And matter of fact, the guy came in from Oklahoma, Jim Hughes, and I wanted to take it with me because he just showed up. And that's not as you hear, you might as well go with me in New York. So Marshall of Oklahoma, but he was glad to do it. He said, I'm here to help you. Well, first of all, it seemed like yesterday, believe it or not, that happened. I can't believe it happened 20 years ago. And in a, in a time like that, my time on the job as a director, all in the marshal service, I never thought that I would experience something like that, which is a terrible thing. But see, so many people get killed, and um, people, you know, like an attack on New York and I uh, think in Pennsylvania, I just could not believe. I thought that was a dream, you know, I was dreaming, but that was real. And it just to look back on it, I said, you know, I still want to how in the world can people do something like that? And and how can you, a person, be convinced uh, in order to kill a bunch of people that want to kill themselves? You know, I said, how, what religion would teach you that? So anyway, I think about that a lot to this day, you know, about what happened. And as a matter of fact, every time I get on the plane to go someplace, I think about that. So Tuesday, September 11th, started as a perfectly normal September day. It, as you've all seen from the pictures, it was a clear, beautiful day. No clouds, no humidity, and it was just one of those wonderful late summer, early fall days. And, uh, and that morning, it was like any other, any other morning, drive in, park my car on Front Street, just up from South Street, and get out. And as I turn the corner to walk up Maiden Lane, because I parked at the corner of Front and Maiden, I look up and I see the tail end of the first plane going into the World Trade Center. So I was like, well, maybe there was some problem, uh, but it was a perfectly clear day. Didn't think that much of it, though by the time I walked the two and a half blocks to my office, we were already getting rained down with papers and other assorted, I'm just going to call it stuff for now, because we never really wanted to think about what was in it. Uh, get to my office, and you know, everybody was concerned, but we were not, <clears throat> there, people weren't frightened yet. We were watching CBS and they had a, a camera on the buildings and then we saw the second plane just very quickly as it come around and hit the World Trade and of course that one was the building with the antenna, the television broadcast antenna on it so the television went dark. Then we realized that this was more than just an accident. This had to be some type of coordinated attack. Finally, unfortunately, when the first building fell, um, I had our facilities department get jugs of water and went downstairs and said, all right, guys, everybody take off your t-shirt. If you have anything you can, rip it up, put it in water, and cover your mouth uh, because of all of the the dust and soot and detritus that was in the air. Uh, the sad thing was is that right after that, you know, within a close proximity of time, everything started to, to happen. It felt everything was happening quickly and yet it was all going slowly at the same time. But I was still uh, in my office and when the second building fell, and we were all grateful it fell down in on itself. The building that we were in, which was built in 1912, the whole building shook like this. And luckily all of our staff were now in, in the lobby. Especially after the second building fell, it just hit them. And you couldn't see in front of your face. That's how bad 
the surrounding area you couldn't see was pitch dark. Even in my, my building on the 25th floor, three plus blocks away, it was black. And I went down there again using the elevator because <laughs> I had no choice. Uh, and once it started to, to settle, they said, right, walk down Maiden Lane to South Street and then walk up South Street because at least you'll be on the river somewhat protected. Once everybody had left the lobby of my employees and the agency's employees, the police department came around and said, it's time to go. Um, we don't know what's going to happen next and everybody's evacuated. So when I was able to walk out, it was a horrific scene and the debris, it, it looked like rock wool blown up. It was gray. Uh, you didn't want to think, was it asbestos? Was it the remnants of people that had been up there building particles? I mean, as we know now, the air was toxic. And at the time we were told, no, don't worry about it. But when I walked out, it was about, it was up to my knee, which is what, two, two and a half feet that you had to walk through. And it looked like a war zone. It was a, a normal day, uh, as everyone can see. Uh, our weather was about the same as New York City. It was a beautiful fall or beginning of fall day. Um, we were quite busy with court scheduled. Um, we had done some prisoner pickups uh, and we were preparing for, for court. Um, the squad room had televisions and uh, we actually, um, we had Fox on and we immediately got uh, notified by the news that something had hit the, the one of the trade centers. And uh, it looked like, and we were thinking accident, having worked down there uh, and seeing the, you know, the air traffic in the area, we, we thought maybe a small plane had hit. And then as we were, were watching, the second plane hit. Well, when you have a squad room full of deputy U.S. Marshals, uh, the first thing that you need to do is is calm them down because they all wanted to get in their vehicles and drive to New York City to see if they could be of assistance. There were a few hours of uh, frustration and anxiety from, from the deputies uh, simply because they felt like they should be doing something. When it became evident that this was what it turned out to be, which was a terrorist attack, uh, of course, we put them to work in, in Albany, um, securing the building, locking things down, making sure that our judges were safe, taking the prisoners back uh, to to jail, and just securing securing our facilities within within Northern New York. You know, I had several phone calls uh, with headquarters that day. I knew I was going to get deployed down there. I just didn't know what time. And, I, and I, I can't say what time, but it was later in the day. Uh, I left late on the 11th to go down there and really didn't arrive until early on the 12th around the, the marshal's office, the courthouse where the marshals are housed is very close to within blocks of, of ground zero. Um, so it was very chaotic. They were, they were like we were organizing, waiting for a mission, if you will. And uh, at that point, they were just starting to put uh, things together to make sure that if we did go down, when we went down, I should say, that it was done in a way that we could keep track of our people. 
I believe almost every deputy was in the squad room, uh, pretty well geared up, ready to go. Um, we, I, I learned at that time that we had several deputies that were down at the at ground zero, uh, went down for the rescue to help evacuate the buildings and, and were there when the buildings collapsed. So we assured that they were all either being medically treated or safe at home. Um, and there was a, there, there were no major injuries to them, unbelievably from what they went through. And I know you'll, you'll let them tell their story. That's probably the most important part of, of this project, as far as I'm concerned, because I learned very early that these, these guys, uh, did some very heroic, heroic things that day. Uh, I joined, I, I had actually gone down uh, when it was still uh, dark and looked around and I, I knew that area. I had, uh, as a young deputy, I had supported New York with their uh, different uh, assignments and I had actually lived in the hotel between the two towers, which was called the Vista. So I went down there and uh, couldn't find my bearings because we always used those two towers as our goalposts, so to speak, to, to find our way. We would walk down there and you could go just about on any street and see them. So it took me a minute to navigate, uh, down there. And, uh, I spent a short amount of time down there and then went back to the office. And, uh, then I went back with the, with the first crew. And that's when I started taking some of the pictures that, that you have. We had a, a, a baby born in June and uh, our apartment was in Brooklyn, just opposite the, the Twin Towers across the East River. I happened to be out in Long Island that day. Uh, my wife uh, and new daughter were with my in-laws and I was teaching a police defensive tactics a class um, at, a, uh, at a training facility in Long Island um, with law enforcement officers from state and local agencies all, all around the country. From, my wife told me that a plane had hit the towers. And uh, I think like most people, I imagined, you know, a small private aircraft like a Cessna. I, um, I had, you know, s some notion of expectancy of terrorist attack just by work that I'd done with the service. So, you know, I'd actually been assigned to write a terrorist response plan was one of the things I'd done for the for the marshal right before I'd left. So I had a notion of vulnerability to terrorist attack, but not on that scale. Um, you know, I did have some thought, well, geez, you know, I hope it's not not terrorism. I hope it's an aviation accident. Um, my my mind was sort of occupied on getting ready, you know, to begin that that class and to uh, going through the curriculum and um, you know, it was sort of focused on on what the day was going to be bringing in that regard. And then, of course, it was the the second, you know, collision, I think, like for, for most of us, um, the second impact, you know, of another plane really changed, I think, most of our thinking about what was happening. Not fully appreciating, of course, the full scope of it at the beginning. So, you know, trying to stay focused on what I was supposed to be doing and assuming everybody else would stay focused on what they were supposed to be doing. And then, then at some point it becomes a division of, you know, where, where am I truly needed more most right now? Is it at home with my family? Is it doing my job? You know, which that day happened to be, you know, teaching, teaching ground fighting, or is it, you know, should I drop everything I'm doing and, and kind of run to the rescue? And again, like I said, I, I had only very recently separated from the service and was still very much connected, you know, to, to law enforcement marshal service and other agencies so it was a it was a real you know it was a real dilemma but it, it wasn't totally obvious what was happening or where you fit in uh you know or where i certainly fit fit in at that point um 
And so I think in that, in the week following, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to really process and think about what do I belong? What can I, you know, where do I belong? What can I be doing right now? And, you know, having that new infant, having that apartment in Brooklyn where, you know, literally littered with documents, having a relationship to, to the marshal service and, and that feeling that, you know, um, we all, I think just viscerally wanted to drag somebody out from under their bed or out of a closet and hold them accountable. You know, I had just made that decision of martial service was very good to me, but I was, you know, had just finished a year in law school. I had uh, opportunities ahead of me and I had the responsibility of law school. And I actually met a, a judge who'd done some counterterrorism work. He was involved in the Oklahoma City trial and had, had worked for a DOJ at Maine Justice and really experienced and one of the few voices of, of wisdom that I'd encountered in that early period. And I had this urge to just drop out of law school, go back to the marshal service, you know, uh, and get, just go, you know, looking for a, for a bad guy. And, and the judge said to me, he said, look, you can do that. He said, you can definitely do that. But he said, um, this war on terror is not gonna be over for a long time. And there's gonna be a place for you in it. And that made sense to me the way you said it. And that really did prove, you know, prophetic for me because, you know, within a number of years after graduating law school, I became the chief of the counterterrorism section in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York, you know, was a fixture on the New York Joint Terrorism Task Force, you know, prosecuted dozens of terrorism cases and reunited with my friends from the Marshal Service and, uh, and the other, you know, law enforcement component agencies, intelligence community, and DOD, and, and really never forgot that moment, you know. So, so that, you know, for me, that really was very crystallized moment. It's we've been attacked, we've been hurt. I had a plan, you know. We all had a plan. How do you react, you know, when when you've been punched? You know, do you drop what you're doing and run, you know, or do you or do you walk and think and, and try to play the long game? Unremarkable day um, in Los Angeles, California. I got a phone call from my father, uh, who was very upset, and I thought, "Oh my God, someone's died in the family." And he said, "You got to turn the TV on. We're being attacked." And I and I didn't understand what he was talking about. Turned the TV on and um, was just seeing earlier recorded footage of the first tower being hit. And so they were playing that again. And I was like, holy cow. And he goes, could this be an accident? And I said, I don't, I don't think this is an accident, Dad. And then while I was talking to him, watching the television, the second plane came and hit the second tower. So it was a, uh, hey, Dad, thanks for the call. Got to go. And then I, I called back to uh, my boss in headquarters and said, Huff, what's going on and what do we need to do? And he said, hey, I'm trying to put some um, response together. And are you available? And I said, absolutely. And uh, he said, let me, let me keep making calls. I will, I will get back to you. I got a call from Huff probably at um, three hours after my initial call, which was eight in the morning, uh, California time, so 11. Uh, so when I when I heard back from Bill, it was already afternoon where he was, uh, probably two in the afternoon his time. And he said, we're going to be sending some, we're going to be sending TOG, uh, Electronic Surveillance Unit Assets to New York, are you still available? And I said, absolutely. He goes, do you have the following? And he laid out kind of what he would like in our kit. How long will it take you to get to San Diego? And I said, what's going on in San Diego? Because that'll be the only plane going out, flying in, in the States that's non-military. 
and it's a JPADS flight. And I said, I can get there in an hour and a half, two hours. And he said, get, get packed up, you know, do what you need to do with the family and then get down to San Diego. Plane's going to be waiting at Lindbergh Field. Uh, Border Patrol is going to be boarding it, you know, with, with you know, boarding some of their line guys that are coming right off the line working the, the border. And you're going to pack whatever you need on and you'll be on that flight. On that day and time, I must have set the land speed record uh, because I made it. It's uh, door to door, I think it was 130 miles. And I did it in about an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, because the plane was, uh, all the seats were filled with the, these uh, Border Patrol officers, um, I was up in the cockpit. And the pilots, I was just listening to the pilots talk, and they were, there's no one on the air. There's nothing going on. We're the only aircraft flying right now. And, you know, the guys were talking about, like, I've been doing this for 40 years. I've never seen anything like it. And I'm just listening, and it's it's a dark night. And we were going from Ohio over into Pennsylvania. And the pilot said, can you see that glow? They turned to me and in the distance. And I said, yeah, I said, those are the trade towers. Those are the trade centers burning. The technical operations group in many ways was um, fashioned after the NYPD's technical assistance response unit, Teru. So Bill reached out to them and said, what can we do? How can we help you? And they said, you know, it'd be great if you could get people here. We understand that you can't. And he said, no, I got, I've got guys. They've come from all over the country. I've got people, I've got equipment. And they were like, can you come to Ground Zero? Can you help us? You're basically going to take some of the load off of us because we're overwhelmed. On top of everything else that we're talking to you about, uh, the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, is asking if we can find the black boxes. Can you help with that? So we're coordinating with NTSB. We're talking to people up at Woods Hall uh, Research. And as a result of that uh, is when one of the scientists said, oh, and by the way, the black boxes, if it's, if it's a... A, a land event, the black boxes, we're going to find the black boxes. If it's a water event, the black boxes have beacons that go off so we can find them, even if they're in, you know, 20,000 feet of water. And Bill said, well, based on the magnitude of the destruction here and that you had two 1,100 uh, foot towers collapse on them and all that associated debris, which was mountainous, which was hundreds, hundreds of feet high. He goes, they're not going to be obvious. If we can even find them, he said, then we need to wet it. You need to get as wet as possible in there. So because that's what's going to trigger, trigger the black boxes to activate. The morning of September the 11th, 2001, uh, it's my second day in New York City, and so I'm excited. I wake up, I'm thrilled to death to start this this uh, training opportunity uh, with Morgan Stanley. And so I'll report to work on the 61st floor, and so I'm in a meeting room with about 330 people, and we take our first break uh, of the morning. So I go into the break room, Now the break, the break room had this perfect view of the Statue of Liberty. Now, the way I was positioned, I could not see World Trade Center number one, which was the North Tower. It was behind me. But I had this perfect view of the Statue of Liberty, and I'm standing there drinking my coffee. I start to see these papers fly past my window. And then shortly thereafter, I realized that's not confetti for a parade. That's manila envelopes. Those are hanging file folders. Those are letters. That's everything that you would see in an office. Then by the time these huge chunks 
of burning concrete and balls of fire started streaming past my window. And I stood there and I watched as these, these chunks of burning concrete landed on top of the other buildings, landed down in the streets. I hollered at one of my managers, one of the supervisors, and I said, you need to come look at this. And he came to the window. As soon as he saw the debris, he said, evacuate. Get out immediately, run. Whatever you do, do not take the elevator. He pointed us in the direction of the stairwell. And so as we began to evacuate, I left everything behind, just took off running, made it to the stairwell. Now at that point in time, everyone's calm. The stairwell's filling up with people. There's enough room for two of us to fit side by side in the stairwell as we start to make our exit. But everyone's calm at this point in time. As we get down around the 50th floor, from the 61st floor down to the 50th floor, the Port Authority gets on the intercom. And that's when they notify us that World Trade Center 1 has been damaged, but World Trade Center 2 is okay. So everyone in World Trade Center 2 go back to your floor, continue working, business as usual. We all continued to go down. The, the thought process and the idea was, hey, we're going get to get out of the building, going to assess the situation. If everything's okay, I'll turn around and go back upstairs. I'll be 15 minutes late for work. Um, I'm not going to get fired for being 15 minutes late for work. And so as we uh, continue down the stairwell, we get down to the 40th floor. And around the 40th floor, I hear a huge explosion. I get slammed against the building. I get slammed against the wall. Fortunately, there's so many people in the stairwell, you can't fall down. And so as the building's violently shaking back and forth, I'm bouncing between people and the wall. The people on the inside of the stairwell are hanging onto the railing. And then after the building stopped violently shaking, it's swaying back and forth. Now this one time, people's no longer calm. Some people, some people freeze. Some people are crying, screaming. People are now pushing and shoving. No one's now calmly walking down the stairs. Now people are shoving and, and trying to force their way down the stairs. And I thought, we're going to kill more people running down here. We're going to cause a stampede. And we're going to kill hundreds, if not thousands, of people trying to run out of here. And so I just started counting every floor that I went down. Hey, we're on the 40th floor. We're okay. We're going to make it. We're fine. I could hear people above me doing the same thing. We're on the 42nd floor. We're okay. We're on the 37th floor. We're okay. As we get down around the 10th floor, debris and smoke begin to backfill the stairwell. I took my tie off. I took my shirt off. And I covered my mouth and nose so I would not breathe in uh, the dust and the debris. I made it down to the very bottom uh, of the stairwell. There was two gentlemen down there. One gentleman... His job was to hold the door open, the fire door open, so that we all could run out. And this gentleman was covered from head to toe in a white dust, almost ghost-like. The other gentleman, I assume he was maybe a, uh, uh, an officer of the fire department, and he was telling people, run as fast as you can. And he pointed to two exits, and he said, evacuate, get out of the building as quickly as possible. And as I ran out of the building, I ran across the street, I stepped up on the sidewalk, and I turned around, and I got to look at both towers. And I saw for the first time these huge, massive holes in both of the towers. The thickest, blackest smoke I've ever seen was bullying out of both of those buildings. And we stood there, and I watched the red fire burn from within those buildings. Actually, I just, as I was walking uh, over to the headquarters building, which again is probably less than, uh, Marshall Service headquarters is probably less than half a mile uh, from the Pentagon. In fact, you could sit in the office and look over at the Pentagon. Uh, the traffic and the sirens were going, so it was just a little bit um, probably uh, after the event. Um, so there was a little bit of chaos in the street. And um, 
I get over to the building and I was asking everybody what was going on. And uh, they said a plane had hit the Pentagon. And that's really the first time I learned of the event. And it was really literally just minutes after people were running through the building, uh, trying to get, uh, find out what was happening. So in response, I think a plane hit the Pentagon. And so I can remember going over the window to, to look out what was going on. And um, again, you could just kind of see smoke and, and people were responding inside the building. Um, and from Marshall Service point of view, uh, it quickly becomes about getting a command center up for any event. So uh, as people were trying to figure out what was happening, uh, security was getting deployed around the buildings. And uh, it was just a, a very um, confusing time. Yeah, so instead of going to the eighth floor, which would have been human resources where the uh, career board would have normally meant, um, I went upstairs to the 12th floor. I had just recently, I mean, probably within maybe 30 to 45 days, just left uh, being acting deputy director. And so the gentleman I was uh, uh, acting deputy director for, who was acting director, uh, Louis McKinney, uh, was the uh, sitting in the director's office. And of course, I went upstairs uh, immediately to see what you know I could assist with and what I could help with, uh, knowing that the command center would be put up. And at the time, I was also uh, what we have called the incident commander for the agency. So when there is an emergency event, uh, normally we stand up immediately uh, emergency response teams. And the incident commander sits over any event that's going to occur and then responds to that. Yeah, so collaboratively, we work with the what would be the assistant directors in the marshal service over the operational branches and uh, the deputy director was concerned about the building and focusing on, you know, security, not knowing what was occurring. And so, um, you know, we collectively as kind of collaborate as a team to start to, again, set up the, what we call the command center, the emergency uh, command center and start to align uh, what response is necessary, what try to get a better understanding from law enforcement locally, what was occurring. And then of course we start to learn in these moments about the buildings being hit in New York City. And so a lot of phone calls start happening. A lot of people are involved at this particular point. Again, the assistant directors from the operational units, judicial security, investigative operations, you know, witness security, all operational personnel are upstairs uh, and we're kind of aligning and giving people's roles and responsibility and working the phones to find out what needs to go on. As the director, of course, is working through the Department of Justice to, to learn what's happening. And if you remember, as a country, we took down all air operations, right? Immediately it goes down. And so um, it becomes very real within that time period that no one has good communications with New York uh, across the entire response um, of law enforcement, intelligence communities. Everyone's like, you know, trying to find out what's happening. And part of that is, uh, uh, I think it was Verizon at the time, uh, their main communications was right down there in the World Trade Center. So it took everything down from a communications perspective. We felt like we could help from the marshal service end because we had the planes that we could put up planes in the air and maybe take the preventional communication teams from Verizon and fly them up to New York to try and reestablish communication. So from a law enforcement perspective, you know, you're, you're trying to respond at the same time you're trying to establish that communication line so that you can. So that's like one of the first things from an incident point that you're trying to make sure we've got to get comms out there so that we can start to communicate. So um, luckily, uh, Ken Pekurek, who is the head of our JPATS Prisoner Alien Transportation System, Kent was a career uh, individual, been around for a long time. So I was able to get him on the phone. And I said, Kent, who can you get us, you know, can we get the planes up in the air? Can we fly a team? Can you get me a plane down to Florida? He said, yeah, but all, all air traffic is down. I said, if I can make that move through an executive order, you know, we work through the director's office over at Department of Justice. Will you be able to make the plane available? Can you get it to Florida? He said, yeah, let me make some phone calls to FAA. I'll work on the schedule, where I can land, what I can do, if you can get an executive order in place. So we start to, again, have to get the legal authority, have to, you know, be able to address our ability to move that and help that team get up there. Yeah, so we walked down from the courthouse and um, and you could feel, you know, the, the debris in the air and the smoke, you know, probably several, several blocks away. And I can remember digging through my, my backpack and taking out like a couple bandanas and putting them over my, my mouth, my nose, and passing a few to the Deputy Innocent Commander uh, Avery. And he says, well, what are these for? And I said, I don't know, but all the stuff in the air, I'm sure can't be good for us. You know, I can remember thinking there was, it was just so thick. 
And uh, we went by one of the churches that are down there in Manhattan, uh, where there's a small cemetery. And um, the uh, powder was probably as high as a tall snowdrift, you know, maybe three or four feet high. And I remember touching over it and I, I looked at Joe and again, we were probably maybe two blocks away at this point, maybe a block and a half. And I said, wow. And I said, it is, what is that? And he says, it's mortar, you know, just from the buildings coming down, you know, that because you know, it was so dark and, and you know, because no lights down there. I thought, man, I can't believe this. So I get down there and New York uh, Police Department, Fire Department, they were like a well-oiled machine uh, down there. They lights her up and they're, they're just, you know, hollering and digging through and climbing any way they can into the, the site. And, uh, you know, again, I was struck by, by the, the acts of, uh, risk that people were taking to try and find survivors and the the emotion and the drive of everyone to the point that we felt ourselves even being pulled in to do anything that we could at the moment and then probably about uh maybe 20 minutes in, in down there um you could hear everyone starting to pull off uh the site for a moment because uh they could feel the trembling of the building on the side and looked up and I, and I can't remember what building it was but it was literally just shaking and so you have this moment like they had to do all day apparently i learned afterwards where we just all had a haul you know we just had to run down uh, any street we could because of the fear of the other surrounding buildings coming down so you recall that other buildings had come down and so this had been going on for the people that were on the dig on and off all day as they pull off and then have to run down and then they would come back and so we had a moment to experience that in the middle of the night and uh you know it's it's quite a moment when you feel that earth uh, kind of underneath your feet you know uh, shaking like that I decided I wanted to take the tour bus on Tuesday morning and go see the Statue of Liberty. It was a beautiful day. Monday morning it had been dreary, cloudy, gray, and today, Tuesday, September 11, was beautiful. It was perfect. I was standing in line talking to a, a couple uh, who had traveled to the United States to visit their nephew. And we're speaking uh, just in conversational speech there. And uh, she said, we're, we're here to visit our nephew. And she turned, uh, we, we were this way, and she turned and she said, he works up there on the North Tower, nearly to the top. And just as she pointed, there was a breakout of like sparkler. It wasn't fire, it wasn't smoke, it was like a 4th of July sparkler. And we heard nothing. She and I had been talking in a conversational tone. There was no, uh, we didn't hear airplanes or anything. And the, we all looked around at each other, what happened? We could not see the other side of the North Tower where United had just hit. The uh, people that were working got busy. They came to us and they said, okay, move on, move on. You, 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 you can't stay here. We gotta get you on the ferry. And uh, we, we did, we, we went quickly. Uh, as to whether we went to the particular ferry we were supposed to, I have no way of knowing. Uh, there were several there. No one took our tickets when we came on. No one did anything. The crowd sort of propelled me towards one end of it. By this time, the smoke out of the North Tower was just snaking up slowly, and it was forming a big uh, cloud over the top and going towards the east. We were bumping, started bumping up against the dock there. I sat straight. I had my purse and my camera. I had that camera with me. And 
I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what had happened. We did not know a plane had hit. We didn't know anything. The So I braced my feet up against the rail and my back up against the back where I was sitting and I took a couple of pictures and then I heard a sound. It was something like a, a drone of an engine. And I looked, okay, I'm, I'm pointed straight ahead. The towers are here. The sky's blue. The smoke is coming up over going towards the east. There's a helicopter and it's darting in and out and up and down under that smoke. So almost like a moth going into a, a flame. And now I can see over to my left, a little speck of an airplane. But to me, it was somebody coming to help. So I set my shot up, my camera, watched the little speck peripherally until it got completely in front of the South Tower and then I pressed the shutter. Those cameras are slow. You have to let it record. And then I pressed again and I got the explosion. I don't remember anything much immediately after that until all of a sudden a hand touched my shoulder. A man said, ma'am, ma'am, you've got to get off the ferry. Everybody's gone. You've got to get off. So I was driving over the Manhattan Bridge uh, about 8.45 in the morning when the radio reports came out that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. I looked up to my left, saw the plane where it had hit the World Trade Center. Um, realizing that we had had past attacks there, I immediately responded back to the office as quickly as I could. And as I uh, arrived at the office, Marshal Qualiatine was standing on the street and directed me to, to go down and do the direct uh, meetings with officials at the site to make a determination. To, 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 <coughs> excuse me, make a determination of what was happening. So at that point, um, I took the priest from um, the local church, uh, who was also there at the scene uh, and was looking to go down to the scene. So I took him with me, drove down to the scene, and got to. Um, it was actually about two blocks away when the second plane hit the hit the second tower. Um, at that point, I met with the mayor of the city of New York, the director of the FBI, um, the Homeland Security people that were on site. Uh, we had a quick meeting discussion on the sidewalk about how responses were going to be done. The marshal had authorized me to offer anything to the city that they would need. And we offered to bring in the bomb dog detail off to courthouses as they already had a sweep of the courthouses that morning. So at that point, we were in discussions with OEM and and they asked that we supply, a because we had a secured perimeter with vehicle barriers, bollards and security patrols, that we would be a repository temporary staging area for uh, a morgue. And so we made arrangements to basically cover up part of the street so people walking down the street would not be able to look in between the courthouses. Uh, and we were making arrangements that that's where we were going to work with them to set up the temporary morgue. Um, and this was by 10 o'clock in the morning, we had started those procedures and then nobody came. And as the buildings collapsed um it just was absolute chaos in the area because the clouds of smoke um and dust from the collapses 
started infiltrating the entire neighborhood and covering the cars. Um, there was a thick, very thick uh, dust clouds that were coming up from the World Trade Center. And at that point, they actually dispersed the ambulances out of that site. Um, and we shut down that operation. And we then started working with OEM and sending teams over to the World Trade Center to begin rescue operations. We had different teams. We brought them in. We brought them over to World Trade. We tried to set everybody up to work in teams so we didn't have anybody who, you know, we, could, we wanted to make sure we kept track of all our employees. Um, one of the things that we did immediately when it happened is we made notification to headquarters uh, and we asked headquarters was dispatching groups of people up from Washington and we asked them to stop along the way and buy as many um, filters and as many respirators as they could purchase from local distributors in those areas. Yeah, so we actually we worked from that Tuesday straight through until Sunday. Um, pretty much most of us were there 24 hours a day. Maybe, you know, so like I went home for an hour and a half or two hours, somewhere between four o'clock and six o'clock in the morning, um, and then came back to the office. Uh, and we continued to work right through till Sunday and actually go into the pile, helping to put, pick through, um, you know, doing bucket brigades. Some of us were doing construction to build uh, ramps to go over the fire hoses because the fire trucks were laying hoses on the roadways. So we we're actually building um, plywood ramps so that you wouldn't rupture the hose if somebody drove over it. Um, and we continued doing those operations up until Sunday. And at that point, Marshall Service Headquarters asked us to pull off the pile because it had become a um, recovery effort versus a rescue effort. Just that, you know, as, as a group, I think that all the Marshal Service employees that had responses related to 9-11 showed their dedication to the agency and to the country. Um, you know, they, everybody, everybody picked up and did what needed to be done and worked hard. And, you know, there was no, everybody was, was part of it. Everybody dug in, everybody did what needed to be done um they supported each other and um tried to support the city of new york to the best of their abilities no matter where you turned every agency every every deputy every district that got involved gave it its all It was, I, I can remember exactly where I was. It was in the uh, the building preceding the one we were in now, which is over uh, close to the airport. Uh, and uh, on television, somebody said a plane just hit the tower. And we all went into the break room where there's a television to, to see what was going on. Uh, there was still some disbelief uh, because it, it very much resembled like an, an old movie, uh, you know, something that really wouldn't be real. But when the second plane hit and that really solidified any doubts in people's minds, of course, you know, being analysts, we were, you know, we, we believed it before the majority of America did. Uh, but most people, I say, you know, at first thought, oh, is this some kind of prank or just some kind of camera trick or, you know, a lot of people didn't believe it. It was really happening. Uh, it was uh, a pretty much pandemonium uh, once the second plane hit. Um, one of my coworkers uh, kind of went into, you know, uh, just literally nervous breakdown mode. And we were trying to, you know, try to keep ourselves together uh, let alone because uh, she genuinely believed, you know, we're under attack. This is the beginning of a bigger attack. Uh, and that was the big fear uh, that this was only the uh, small front of something larger. And, uh, 
but I recall there being a great deal of anger. I was I was very angry that somebody would dare do this. So that's uh, that was pro pretty much the first things that happened uh, after that uh, took place. And then we were all trying to figure out what can we do to help? What can we do to, to assist? Um, administrative employees were sent home after about an hour, an hour and a half, in which we were one. Uh, but uh, not before we were able to uh, work out what was going on. Uh, we had to go to the airports. Uh, we had to close down courts. We had to grab judges um, as you know, we saw fit if they were in a dangerous position. There was one judge that was up in the Capitol building. Don Horton had to go up there and drive on the sidewalk. You get, you know, literally had to pull him out of a meeting. And you know, you know, judges, they're they're not happy if you, you know, if you you're doing things that they don't like, and uh, especially if they don't know why. Yeah, um, that one we saw from the window. Uh, we literally, you could smell it before you could see it. Uh, and that was the, the thing that probably got me the most as a smell. It literally stayed for weeks. Uh, but you, we saw the huge pillage of smoke. We did not know initially how bad the damage was to the Pentagon. And uh, that's when our personnel uh, literally, and for the first time, our canine program uh, with Mike Pio, uh, with Beacon, the very first canine, uh, was the first assignment. Go to the Pentagon to, to see what you could do to help. One of the things um, we, were, we were tasked to do, with, you know, within a very short period of time, uh, when we were back in the office, I was still an intelligence analyst at that time. Uh, our group was uh, tasked with a lot of other law enforcement sources to utilize, you know, uh, their analytical skills uh, for uh, you know, primarily a group of suspects to be passed into a central uh, place. Uh, mainly the FBI was the clearinghouse. They were the lead on on the investigation but we helped i mean we we were uh, that was the way we contributed uh, so we were able to uh, do uh, profiling i suppose is for the sake of a better word uh, in, or, in order to try to find some of these possibilities some of the names were very similar to each other and uh, you had to make sure that <laughs> you weren't confusing one person for another. Uh, that was uh, that was pretty much uh, part of the problem. Uh, but uh, it, it, we did do a fair bit of that uh, in the in a couple of weeks after that, and we were able to turn in uh, various leads in, which were followed up by FBI and our personnel and and other law enforcement, and uh, you know we. I, I seem to think we contributed. On the morning of 9-11, uh, I was sitting in the office. We had been in the office for a while and uh, making plans to meet with my management staff. And it was, uh, I remembered very well, it was a beautiful day weather-wise, very clear, beautiful day. The courthouse was bustling. We were all about doing the government business. We had jury trials going, witnesses, prisoners coming in and out, um, a lot of public in the building was very busy that day television sets throughout throughout the uh you know various media types throughout the office and i was actually watching and listening at the same time as preparing 
our documents for the meeting and uh, I heard somebody say, I forget which channel it was, that a plane had gone into the uh, to a, the Twin Towers at, at, uh, in New York City. And my first reaction was, well, that's not a normal thing. That's very unusual. Something's wrong. And my antennas went up immediately. And of course, seven minutes later, um, another plane hit the South Tower. And immediately I knew, and I, I just jumped up and I went into the chief and he met me. I didn't even, I didn't even get into the office. He was coming out of the office and the assistant chief was coming down the hall. We know that that's not normal. That's not something, that's something very contrived. It's not an accident. All of us had been with the agency for 20 plus years. And so the three of us had a lot of experience. We had worked missions locally, nationally, overseas. We had, had, we had a lot of experience and we had a lot of plans in place for not something this catastrophic, of course. Now in the long term, we look and see what, what unfolded. In the short term, it was um, something that we just exercised our security plans that we already had in place. We had made numerous, had numerous contacts with people throughout other law enforcement agencies in the military over years. And not just us, our predecessors, uh, people that worked throughout the office administratively, operationally. We had a lot of contacts in the area. We're all we're from the area, um, and we knew exactly what we had to do. And our immediate action was to evacuate the building, all three federal courthouses, because we had heard from our contacts in the FBI that one, possibly two, came out of Boston. We heard that early on. So we knew uh, the airport from the federal courthouse in Boston is right across the water, three miles distance if you drive, but we can see planes land and take off from the airport. That's how close we are on the harbor because Logan Airport in Boston is also on the harbor. So we could just look across and see planes land and take off. We knew how close we were. We also knew that every federal courthouse, like a lot of public buildings, um, are targets. So we got a call from the director's office that just, or the assistant director and just said um, that they had had a conference call with uh, someone who had been on the president's conference call and that uh, we were in charge of opening Logan Airport. And whatever we needed to do to get that open, call, it'll get done. And so that was, that was probably the second day. And uh, again, we had closed the federal courthouses, all three, I believe, or maybe just two, just Boston and Worcester uh, on the second day. And uh, our plans were to reopen, of course, on the third day. And now we have this new task uh, to also open Logan Airport. In order to do that, you know, we're a small operation, but we're very efficient. And you tell us what you need done, we're going to get it done. And uh, we had talked to our director or the director's office and advise them that we need bodies. We need to get it done. So send us bodies. And as you may remember, the skies were very quiet, eerily quiet. You heard nothing for days, nothing. And uh, except over the city of Boston, two military planes arrived with Border Patrol agents to help us. Our job was to help eliminate the fear by opening that airport and assisting the Massachusetts State Police over there, uh, all the federal agencies that were there, such as U.S. Customs. So we devised a plan. It was an excellent plan, and it worked very well. And Border Patrol augmented. They came in to augment the uh, force of Massachusetts State Police, Customs, etc., at the airport. And it was tremendous to have them because as we know, they're very good at, uh, they're trained as our most law enforcement, of course, to be able to detect suspicious activity, suspicious persons. And it was very good to have them there. They had wonderful suggestions. They worked very well with everybody. And uh, they were there for quite a while. I, I'm going to say they were there till December.
what I do recall is sometime in the morning, uh, I received a call from one of my uh, deputy regional directors. In fact, he was in Dallas. And when I answered the phone, he said, uh, hey, did you hear about the plane hitting the World Trade Center? And I said, no, I haven't. So I immediately turned on the TV. My first thoughts, uh, I'm a pilot. My first thoughts were, I don't know how this could be accidental. Although I do recall reading about a bomber crashing into the Empire State Building uh, back in the 40s. Uh, so I was more questioning it and I was watching it while we were talking and then watched the second plane go in and knew you know, that confirmed, of course, that this was not an accident. This was intentional. It was some type of terrorist operation. And then we activated the uh, uh, our command center. Uh, the command center at INS uh, was not set up all the time. It's when we had a major uh, thing going on uh, so that we could uh, have communications nationwide uh, and have dedicated lines and dedicated screens for what we're following. So we set that up and and watched. I, we made the assumption that uh, this was not uh, a domestic terrorism, uh, but it was, well, it was an assumption, it was a guess, and started pouring through what we could do. We, got, we received a call from uh, the FBI later that day, uh, having identified the uh, people on board identifying them as terrorists. And we went to looking into how they got in this country, whether any of them were US citizens, uh, when was the last time they came in, that kind of stuff. And we started gathering that information for the FBI because the FBI had uh, jurisdiction over terrorist operations. But we did more than that. And it wasn't the same day, but uh, when somebody is in the country illegally or uh, they're in the country and they violated some uh, immigration statute, we're the ones that have the authority to act on that. Uh, the normal procedure is uh, we will arrest them and then either tell them that they have to appear before a judge or we will put them in some type of detention uh, until they can appear before a judge. So what we did is when the FBI started uh, but as they were arresting and as other uh, jurisdictions around the country were investigating and arresting people that they thought had something to do with the 9-11 attacks, they needed a, a means to hold them. If they had a legal means in their own jurisdiction, that's fine. They did it. But if they had reason to believe that they were involved in 9-11 attack, but they didn't have enough information to go to a judge, but there was an immigration uh, charge against them, we would put a detainer on them and then we would take them into custody and hold them while the investigation was going. But anyway, the, the point is there are a lot of uh, emotions uh, running hard uh, as people were trying to do their job, but very concerned about this. So we realized that uh, we in INS realized that although we had the authority to hold them, we also had to watch out for their rights, the individual's rights. So we set up a system that we would hold them on a legal immigration detainer, but we would review it uh, uh, essentially constantly, but you know, at least weekly and see what the status of the investigation is because it would be very easy for somebody to be arrested and then the arresting agency either not get information or essentially forget about them and then we would have them in custody for a long period of time. We didn't want that to happen. That's against uh, their rights. So we set up a system that anyone that was arrested uh, and then given to us uh, to detain, we set up a system where we would track them, what who the arresting agency is, what information they had, what's the status of their case, so we could make a decision on releasing them. And I don't mean release, just let them go. I mean, we still have the immigration, but we don't keep all those people uh, in detention. So we set up this system uh, and uh, I worked very closely with the FBI on their cases. I worked through the FBI on cases uh, with some of the sheriff's departments or police departments uh, in and around New York City uh, so that 
when we were going to let somebody go, we told them to. This turned out to be this turned out to be an incredibly good move for the United States. First of all, it's the right thing to do. You can't just hold people uh, in detention for too long. Um, but secondly, uh, after 9-11, in fact, in the 10 years after 9-11, the United States government was sued uh, many, many times for unlawful detention or uh, making or, you know, the way they were, people were held or where they were held. Every one of those lawsuits was dismissed. None of them were founded. And the reason that came about is because of our uh, system that we had. And part of that system was I was the only one in government that could release somebody. 